In 2011, revolution swept the Middle East, but this seemingly faraway turmoil has cast a long shadow because the very same political party whose member assumed power in June 2012 in Egypt has also been setting up front groups 5,000 miles away. For decades now, the Ikhwan, or the Muslim Brotherhood, have operated secretly behind the scenes in America. Their influence reaches from the halls of academia, to Hollywood and the media, even to law enforcement, and to the highest levels of political power. Their dream is the creation of an Islamic state. Their utopia is having the law be Sharia. So their strategy in America, I believe, is to use America's freedoms and liberties in order to achieve that dream. If they want to place their real agenda on the table and say, this is what we stand for, then they're welcome in the political arena. Let them debate the caliphate in the American political system. Now that the United States government has acknowledged formally resuming contact with Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, how much do we really know about this shadowy organization's activities here in the U.S.? The Muslim Brotherhood is an international movement, the goal of which is to create an Islamic state universally all over the world. The Muslim Brotherhood operates in various countries around the world. And as we learned in the course of our investigation and our work, the United States was one of those. The Muslim Brotherhood started in 1928 by the founder, Imam Hassan al-Banna. May Allah be pleased with his soul. The environment where Hassan al-Banna was born, there was colonization of British troops in Egypt. There was a touch of westernization going on in the society uh, with liberalism, and uh, there was a sort of westernization. So he wanted to bring people back to Islamic values. The Muslim Brotherhood had twin strategies. The first strategy is its public face, which is a political organization with charitable organizations. But the core of the organization and the master plan of the organization is a sense of world domination. Their ambition is limitless. Center, and they had these big banners 
hanging up from the, uh, uh, over, the, over this uh, area. And it said, death to Israel, death to America. One of the, the people who were working with me said, you know what, Bob, these people are Muslim Brotherhood. I said, what's that? Now, in my mind, the Muslim Brotherhood is the mother of all Islamic organization of the 20th century, including Al-Qaeda. For years, the U.S. government had been dealing with Muslim Brotherhood front groups and leaders, though unaware of the secret roles they played in the Brotherhood infrastructure in the U.S. The West, as we see today, instead of isolating the Muslim Brotherhood, actually engaging the Muslim Brotherhood as the organization that's moderate, and as these are the Muslims we can talk to. The West is tremendously naive about the danger of these various Islamic organizations. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, guide the leaders of this nation who have been given a great responsibility in worldly affairs. Guide them and grant them righteousness and wisdom. Saraj Wahaj, a sometime leader and prominent speaker at events hosted by American groups connected with the Muslim Brotherhood, was chosen to give the first Muslim invocation before Congress in 1991. Here's Wahaj in front of his own congregation long before his congressional appearance. Every day they will go to school and they'll put an American flag in front of these little babies, Muslim babies. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Bullshit! Here he is after his congressional appearance. I want to defend this country. You know what this country is? It's a garbage can. It's filthy. It's filthy and sick. How do you define the good guys, you know? Um, if the good guy definition is they will not be engaged in terrorist activities. Well, yeah, OK, they're the good guys. But in terms of the um, democratic social order that, that we have here and what's mainstream, well, they may not be the good guys. These are the words of other leaders of American Muslim organizations that have roots in the Muslim Brotherhood. I find that there are only two things which are open to our movements, ballot or bullet, nothing in between. Our job is to change the Constitution of America. Ultimately, the Muslim Brotherhood wants to establish an Islamic state in America. They believe that Western civilization is corrupt is evil, is decadent, and they want to um, dismantle it. Abdurrahman Muhammad had not openly renounced his affiliation with radical Islam until he participated in this film. Muslims worldwide are ordinary people who want to make an honest living. But these people hijacked them and recruited them into a fight that's not theirs. It is the Muslim Brotherhood fight to turn the West into an Islamic caliphate or some fantasy in their heads. Uh, but that's not the plight of ordinary Muslims. Islam the faith is something very distinct from the political ideology Islamism. Islamism is basically a, a movement to put into place a government that uses as its source of law the Quran and the Sunnah. Not a source of law, but the source of law. Political Islam believes that all the answers to every human condition is in the Quran, and there's no differentiation between religion and politics because religion is politics. The 
العودة إلى تطبيق الشريعة والعودة إلى الجهاد أربعة ضرورية talk to normal people who are not involved in this stuff at all and talk about the establishment of a caliphate as being someone's long-term goal, you lose them immediately. <laughs> it's, it's so uh, far outside the realm of what we consider to be possible or normal that it's sort of immediately dismissed as being crazy talk. I don't think it matters much which we, what we say about them. I think it matters tremendously what they say about themselves and to each other. This religion, that is Islam, it shall govern the whole universe. The Islamic civilization should rule and govern and direct people in every walks of life, but not to be governed uh, by uh, others. Kamal Helbawi is the only spokesperson for the Muslim Brotherhood who agreed to be interviewed for this documentary. Upon his return to Egypt in 2011, Helbawi eulogized Osama bin Laden as a martyr and one of the good people. Anything mentioned in the Quran, they believe in it 100%. And they want to implement it, not only to believe, but they would like to implement it. And they are trying very hard to, to invite others to the same uh, uh, orientation and the same trend. Like Helbawi, Yusuf Karadawi is a big proponent of Dawah, a doctrine that mandates carrying out a variety of proselytizing activities, leading to the conversion of all non-Muslims to Islam. Here, Karadawi tells an audience in Ohio about the group's goals to conquer the world, including the United States. <laughs> To realize its vision in America, the Muslim Brotherhood gave rise to a complex interlinked network of Islamic organizations, groups that present a seemingly legitimate public face to camouflage their hidden U.S. agenda, with civic-sounding names echoing those created in the heyday of the civil rights era, such as the Muslim Students Association, MSA, the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, CARE, Collectively, these groups dominate representation of the Muslim American community, though not one of them incorporates the words Muslim Brotherhood in its name. The Muslim Brotherhood is like the Russian doll. It's one organization inside another, inside another, inside another, and it's endless. You never have a complete sense of it unless you have the totality of the dolls. They are very, very clever if you are privy to their master plan. Our code name for the series of cases that I was engaged in from the late 90s uh, through 2007 was codenamed Tangled Web. And I have always believed that one could not have come up with a more appropriate term because that's what it was. This is the same conclusion the FBI had come to 20 years earlier. This is the uh, headquarters for the Islamic Society of uh, North America just outside Plainfield, Indiana. Robert Stauffer managed an FBI investigation into Muslim Brotherhood finances in the 1980s. When I started looking at the source of, of this money and, and where it came from, it came from like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Afghanistan, Egypt, Kuwait, Malaysia, Pakistan. All these Muslim countries were sending money via wire transfers to the United States, to NATE. NATE, the North American Islamic Trust, served as a financial holding company for Muslim Brotherhood-related groups, including ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. Its major source of funding came from Saudi Arabia and other Muslim countries. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars coming into NATE for distribution to individuals and to organizations and to purchase property. 
The purpose of all this money was underscored in one of a series of 1980s documents recently declassified by the FBI regarding the Muslim Brotherhood. The Ikhwan in the United States has as its ultimate goal political control of all non-Islamic governments in the world. Stauffer tags sources of money to people and organizations, then look for evidence of criminal activity. All of these had money going through this currency transaction here. And then where did it go? It went to MSA, Nate, Triple IT. When he mapped it all out, he felt he was looking at a Trojan horse, which became the Bureau's code name for the investigation. Stauffer found that the leadership of many of the Muslim American groups was intertwined. And after I began thinking, hmm, <laughs> are these really separate groups or are they all the you know, really the same people dividing themselves in different ways for specific political ends. One ISNA leader is quoted in Stauffer's investigation as declaring the leaders and their organizations to be incompatible with American society. Ultimately, we can never be full citizens of this country because there is no way we can be fully committed to the institutions and the ideologies of this country. The Justice Department ultimately closed down the FBI's investigations without filing charges. Nate and the other group's status as religious and nonprofit organizations gave them a certain amount of cover from law enforcement. Deception itself just needs to be exposed in the same way that racism can't be just generically outlawed. It has to be exposed in order for it to be uh, delegitimized. That's the only way these groups will end up becoming exposed through the disinfecting of sunshine. There's some good people in these organizations, and a lot of them themselves don't even know the inner workings of the Brotherhood. But you have to know the personalities who founded these things. You have to look at what they were calling themselves before they changed the name. You have to follow uh, the paper trail. In August 2004, a Virginia man and his wife were stopped on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge in Maryland for videotaping the bridge's suspension cables. Federal investigators knew Ismail El Barasi had already been under scrutiny for his connections to the terrorist group and Muslim Brotherhood spawned organization, Hamas. Ultimately, that arrest led to a search warrant of Mr. El Barasi's home, which revealed thousands of documents that absolutely blew the doors open on our understanding of the Muslim Brotherhood movement in the United States. We had discovered to our amusement that he was actually um, kind of the archivist for the American branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. The FBI found a cache of documents detailing the structure of the Muslim Brotherhood in the U.S., including this one, revealing the goals of the group in America. It was titled An Explanatory Memorandum on the General Strategic Goal for the Group in North America. It's dated May 22, 1991. The document named the organizations that could be enlisted to achieve the group's goals. 29 American Muslim groups were named either as Brotherhood organizations or Friends of the Brotherhood. The list included such prominent Muslim organizations as the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, the Muslim Students Association, MSA, the Islamic Circle of North America, ICNA, and the Islamic Association for Palestine, IAP. I thought of them as brotherhood groups, but I think it would have been somewhat difficult to prove. But it wasn't until the explanatory memorandum came out that one could say, ah, okay, well, so we were right. <laughs> you know, these groups are clearly enumerated. The documents and the information on those documents that we reviewed was entirely consistent with our years of covert investigation. The fascinating thing to me is that they describe in some detail their thinking. In the United States, you need organizations. Therefore, we set up organizations. Boom, 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 boom. And there they are. And I think that sort of the, the understanding of the American culture and, and the American political structure demonstrated by that is rather extraordinary. The organizations that were on that list represented a huge segment 
of the Islamic voice in North America at the time. The memorandum not only named names, it candidly revealed just how the Brotherhood viewed the United States as a target for conquest. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan, which is what the Brotherhood uses to describe themselves, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. That's pretty clear as to how they viewed their own objective. Uh, and this is, they're talking about the United States here for the first time that was almost direct proof of what we had long suspected about um, their, their, their true political goals with the United States. There was a systematic plan to establish an Islamist beachhead in the United States with the eventual goal of watching the United States crumble from within and establishing Islamic rule in this country. Something like the explanatory memo is a bonanza for the art of intelligence because it, it actually is the target or the subject speaking in their own words about what they intend. You don't have to read too much into that. In their own words, these are examples of radical dogma presented to audiences across America. American society is not hardwired. The society doesn't have a rigid code. How can we allow? We do have a code. We have a code. So, so that gives us an advantage because they are like jello and we are like a knife. So there is uh, jihad, the primary jihad of the Quran is the jihad with the world. But there is jihad in the sense of violence. There is no doubt about it. Islam is not a pacifist religion. Islam is a realistic religion. The only obligation that we have to live in this country is doubt. Because, why am I saying that? Because we are paying taxes. These taxes are going to killing people, our brothers and sisters. So we better have a pretty good justification for us here. The end goal of everything that we're talking about is the establishment, the re-establishment of the Islamic form of government. It is very important media in the United States is very vulnerable. Okay. And they will see you have something, especially as a Muslim, if you have something to say, they'll come running to you and take advantage of that. We write the article itself, all we ask the reporter, write your name and it becomes yours. We're not after credit, just write it, you put your name on it, and it becomes yours. This is the best way. When you write the article, you tell them what's going on. The Muslims in this <laughs> case, they strategy of Gramsci. جرامشي فيلسوف إيطالي لما كان في السجن فكر أن العمال طبق العاملة مش ممكن تأخذ السلطة السياسية إلا إذا أخذت السلطة الثقافية يعني الثقافة متاعها انتشرت بين الناس بالإعلام والتعليم في كل مكان وقتها تأخذ السلطة You have people who are being deceived by a campaign of deception brazen lies that are presented as the truth and abetted by uh, those in government or the media that embrace it and then ensure that it's perceived as the truth. Other documents found in Ismail El Barasi's archive in 2004 provide more detail on the Brotherhood's tactics. This document reads, no doubt America is the ideal location to train the necessary resources to support the movement worldwide with its need for brothers who are trained in different fields, administrative, media, political, and others. We encourage Islamic centers to assign scholarship and give scholarship for five students every year. Imagine if we do it nationwide. Five years from now, you will have an army of lawyers. You will have an army of politicians and an army journalists, an army of teachers who go to schools, universities, can educate people on the history of Islam and the history of Islam.
see so many organizations working on so many fronts to use our very system, the systems that they deplore, our democracy, our constitution, our rule of law, our tolerance, that's what they use to exploit their message. That's what they use to protect themselves and to create a facade around them that would allow them to internally operate and seek to achieve their true, often unstated objectives. False accusations of racism and Islamophobia are routinely made against critics of radical Islam. When I was new on the editorial board with the Dallas Morning News, we had a scheduled meeting with Dr. Syed Saeed, who was at that time the head of the Islamic Society of North America, the largest Muslim organization in the country. Dr. Saeed came in and sat down with us and gave a long discourse about peace and tolerance and Islam and religion in America. You, you couldn't possibly object to anything he had to say. And his final message to us was, you journalists need to stand with us and help stamp out religious intolerance and bigotry. Great. And I asked him in the Q&A period, Dr. Said, if you really do believe in peace and tolerance, why do you have on your board? And I went through one by one the names of people who sat on his board, Muslim leaders, and pointed out the radical things they had said. One had spoken at the death to the Jews rally outside the White House in 2000. I said, how do you reconcile your st stance of public stance of peace with that? Well, he got so angry, he shook his fist at me and said, this is like Hitler's Germany. You will repent of what you're saying. He never answered the question, just shook his fist again and talked about Islamophobia and bigotry and my need to repent and how one day I would repent of being so insulting. So after I wrote my column uh, criticizing Dr. Saeed, I became what a local Muslim group called on their website, the new face of hate. My picture went up on their website and they began to talk about me as the sort of person who is going to lead to violence against Muslim, pogroms against Muslims in Dallas. I signed on to their email listserv just to see what they were saying. With my own name, no deception there, they said we want to make Roger a joke in this town. It was very personal, but it taught me something about the way they work. They weren't willing to take me on and refute me factually or, or refute my logic. They wanted to run around behind the scenes and convince everybody that I was a raving lunatic who was going to get Muslims beat up here. What's disingenuous and, and, I'm, and why we keep falling for it is a mystery to me is this idea that you can keep, you, you keep presenting little bits and pieces of your agenda, moving it slowly along and, uh, and crying foul every time something happens you don't like. Oh my God, you're being mean to us again. We can close our eyes and pretend it doesn't exist. We can call everybody a, a, a bigot or an Islamophobe if they even talk about it, but you're not going to solve the problem and the problem is increasing exponentially. Even when Muslims speak out against radicalization in a congressional hearing, if they are not part of the Brotherhood Legacy Network, they are made into boogeymen. I welcome anyone to walk into any mosque in the United States and ask the name of organizations present here. CARE, MPAC, ICNA. You'll get people that know that organization inside that mosque. So these are organizations with a grassroots touch in the American Muslim community. Uh, do the same for Dr. Jasser, and you will not find that his name is well known. The campaign to smear Zudi Jasser went online with a Facebook profile that threatened his safety. The name of the page? Zudi Jasser is a clown and an Uncle Tom Muslim. They take somebody who is a respected person in the community, they demonize him rather than deal with the ideas. The others that may be fearful of speaking out will see that and say, look what happens to this guy when he speaks out, so we're not going to do it. At the end of the day, it's a moral corruption within a certain segment that is using our religion, hijacking it for a theopolitical movement that is not only domestic, but it is global. At a hotel just off a busy highway in Philadelphia, a secret meeting is called to order in October 1993. Attending are two dozen American supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and leaders of Hamas, a Palestinian Islamic terrorist group. Ismail al barasi the keeper of the explanatory memorandum, is among them. Their agenda, how to derail recent advances in the Middle East peace process between Israel and the PLO. The FBI was watching and listening. <laughs> عفوا يعني وبعدين شعرين كذلك انه امريكا اذا اذا احنا فعلا 
During the meetings, the group used code in an effort to confuse anyone who might be listening. The code for Hamas was Sama, Hamas spelled backwards. <laughs> Hamas, a Muslim Brotherhood organization, at this time was carrying out acts of violence in Israel, including kidnappings, drive-by shootings, and stabbing attacks. It became a U.S.-designated terrorist group in 1995. They even specifically discuss how do we keep ourselves from being defined as terrorists. They recognize when the doors are shut, they recognize that supporting Hamas is supporting terrorism. They know what the word means. And the concern was, if it is revealed what we truly support, then we will no longer be able to operate in this country the way in which we have been able to operate to date. There were obstacles. First, how to market Hamas terrorism to Muslims. <laughs> And second, how to disguise Hamas's terrorist agenda for non-Muslims. The men gathered here were responsible for Hamas fundraising, and the only way to open wallets was to win hearts and minds. Here you have individuals, their true political goal, which is to represent Hamas's interest in America, and they find that their constituency is too small, so they broaden the constituency to the entire Muslim population, which is the classic Islamist ideological tool, which is to take a local political conflict and broaden it to the entire Muslim ummah, or community. For these men gathered in Philadelphia, the mission was just one campaign in a war. War is deception. Once you accept the fact that the system that you're living under at the present time is illegitimate, okay, then you're prepared to do anything illegal, um, underhanded, deceptive. Um, the whole thing is illegitimate. You're in a war. So all bets are off. Some of those attending this meeting would be generals in this stealth war. At least two were officials from IAP, or the Islamic Association for Palestine, a Hamas front, and one of the 29 crucial groups listed in the explanatory memorandum. Omar Ahmad was president of the IAP. Accompanying him was IAP public relations director, Nihad Awad. Here are Nihad Awad's real views on Hamas. Things. Um, I used to support the PLO, and I used to be the president of the General Union of Palestine Students, which is part of the PLO here in the United States. But after I researched the, the situation inside Palestine and outside, I am uh, in support of uh, the Hamas movement more than the PLO, not because Hamas is disruptive and in, involved in, in violence. No. Uh, I know that uh, this movement, as an Islamic movement, has not been objectively reported in the United States. Within weeks of this speech, Hamas began introducing suicide bombings as a strategy in Israel. The Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas advertising themselves as being peaceful organizations was nothing more than a pragmatic ruse to convince the world that uh, they were mainstream and moderate. You need only scratch the surface to see that, uh, in fact, they were not. Within a year of the Philadelphia meeting, Omar Ahmad and Nihad Awad 
would help to rebrand the Hamas Front, IAP, as the Council on American-Islamic Relations, CARED. In July 2005, after deadly terror attacks in London, a coalition of Brotherhood-aligned Muslim American groups saw an ideal opportunity to hone their positive public image. They would issue a carefully worded fatwa, a religious decree against terrorism. Islam strictly condemns religious extremism and the use of violence against innocent lives. There is no justification in Islam for extremism or terrorism. Having our religious scholars side by side with our community leaders leaves no room for anybody to suggest that Islam and Muslims condone nor support any forms or acts of terrorism. Yet elsewhere, these and other signers of the fatwa have called out for acts of violence or terrorism, albeit sometimes in veiled language. Because if you remain on the side of injustice, the wrath of God will come. Please, please, all Americans, do you remember that? That Allah is watching everyone. God is watching everyone. If you continue doing injustice and tolerate injustice, the wrath of God will come. We are here today to tell our brothers and sisters in Palestine that you have learned the way that you have known that the jihad way is the way to liberate your land. They take terms like jihad, like terrorism, and they redefine it for themselves to justify and rationalize the positions they're taking. So someone might say, do you support terrorism? They say no, because they don't believe that acts, for example, by Hamas against Israeli civilians is terrorism. A typical response is to avoid condemning officially designated terrorist groups, Hamas or Hezbollah by name, hiding behind the broad term terrorism. When pressed by the reporter to condemn Hamas and Hezbollah, this CARE official repeatedly refused. I'm telling you in a very clear fashion, CARE condemns terrorist acts, whoever commits them, wherever they commit them, whenever they commit them. Under George W. Bush, the Department of Homeland Security's Michael Chertoff set forth recommendations, like avoiding such words as jihadist. This same language is proudly embraced by some Islamists. Allah will promise you that you're not going to die in jihad. It is an honor to die in jihad. Yes. You don't like jihad? Yes, jihad. Look, jihad is the tightest thing in Islam. Sure, don't compromise on these little things. Be proud of it. Why? Because Islam is a perfect religion. If you sit here and you start, uh, you know, saying jihad is only internal, this and this and that, you are compromising on your faith. Jihad is very much like sexism and racism. You can smell it. No matter what the language, the sly language being used, this is something that, uh, you know when you see it. This is how the language is contorted. This is how the language is manipulated. This is how the agenda is hidden, is hidden in the language. The goal is peace, in one word, peace. Islam is peace. Yeah, it is, Islam is peace. But peace is not necessarily freedom. Peace just means um, the absence of opposition. To prevail everywhere and justice. Who would ever have a problem with justice? Jihad is just to establish justice. So when you hear the word justice, you think fighting for someone's rights or um, trying to make sure that no one is mistreated or abused or whatever. That's not how Muslim fundamentalists define justice, okay? Justice can only come from Allah, from God. We, don't, we will never have justice until we have an Islamic state because whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed is an oppressor. The goal is equality. The goal is respect of human rights. 
The goal is to leave Muslims and non-Muslims together in one society. أيها الإخوة الكرام، إن القضية الفلسطينية ليست صراعا على حدود ولا أرض فحسب، فحسب، بل هي صراع حضاري، منهج شيطاني يتزعمه يهود ومن يوالونهم، ومنهج رباني تحمله حماس والحركة الإسلامية جميعا والشعوب الإسلامية من ورائها. These type of radical Muslims, they know their agenda is so um, is so sensitive. I mean, if if every if anyone ever caught wind of what they're doing, you know, they'd be finished. So they they have to hide it. They have to mask it. They hide it in plain sight. That's what they do. They hide it in plain sight. Speaking in 1996 before the Islamic Association for Palestine, a Hamas front and one of the groups listed in the explanatory memorandum, this was Muslim Brotherhood leader Abdurrahman Alamudi. Before other audiences, Alamudi would not be so blunt, yet. He was a quintessential Muslim Brotherhood person who was um, very articulate and well-educated and had been in the media, and he used the media very effectively. Mr. Alamudi, yes. is there a network of Islamic extremists that are committed to jihad? In America? Yes. No. A 1996 Wall Street Journal editorial by Steve Emerson, entitled Friends of Hamas in the White House, connected Alamudi politically and financially to Hamas leader Musa Abu Marzouk. Later that year on Arabic television, Alamudi spoke of his intimate relationship with Marzouk, before realizing that by mentioning Hamas by name, he tied himself to the larger Brotherhood network. Off camera in America, he spelled out the ulterior Brotherhood aims. <laughs> Publicly, Alamudi established ties with powerful members of Congress and presidential candidates. Alamudi was someone who I think embodied really the, uh, the ability for these organizations to penetrate a very deep level of society and a deep level of our government. The Defense Department provided further access for Alamudi, putting him in charge of the military's Muslim chaplain program. The State Department even selected Alamudi to serve as a goodwill spokesman to the Muslim world. Documents reveal that the State Department spent at least $40,000 to send Alamudi on speaking tours in the Middle East from 1992 to 2001. Alamudi discussed the state of Islam in America in countries such as Saudi Arabia, Syria, Jordan, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. In a 1999 visit to Amman, Jordan, on a goodwill mission, he gave a moderate speech at the U.S. Embassy. But later that afternoon, in an undercover interview, he revealed his support for violence. <laughs> Back home a year later, Alamudi finally merged his public persona and private allegiances at a Washington, D.C. rally just steps from the White House. This video was taken after the mainstream media had left for the day. I 
have been labeled by the media in New York to be a supporter of Hamas. Anybody support this Hamas here? Hear that, Bill Clinton. We are all supporters of Hamas. Allahu Akbar. I wish they added that I'm also a supporter of Hezbollah. Anybody supports Hezbollah here? Verbally supporting terror groups while shocking is not illegal. On the other hand, in January of 2001, Alamudi traveled with several other members of the American Muslim Brotherhood to Beirut to meet with leaders of Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and Al-Qaeda. The goal of the meeting was to unite the terror groups to wage jihad against Israel and the U.S. to secure Muslim control of Jerusalem. Beyond all of his other associations, Alamudi was also close with the country of Libya, at the time designated a state sponsor of terrorism. He was a person we were monitoring uh, in the same way that we monitor other people who are believed to be agents of foreign powers. In March 2003, yeah. Libyan President yeah. Muammar al-Qaddafi felt he was publicly insulted by Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah and recruited Alamudi to work on an assassination plot against the Crown Prince. During the stopover in London in September 2003, British custom officials found $340,000 in cash in a briefcase with Alamudi. U.S. officials later charged him with prohibited transactions with Libya, lying on immigration forms and supporting terrorism. This Treasury document states Alamudi had been an al-Qaeda fundraiser for years while he was still meeting with countries on behalf of the U.S. He received a sentence of 23 years for his crimes. He declined to be interviewed for this program. However, in a written response, he made this startling admission from prison. I am, I hope, still a member of the Muslim Brotherhood organization in the USA. Abdurrahman Alamudi's political efforts in America would become eclipsed by those of another Muslim Brotherhood front group. Immediately after the events of September 11, 2001, a coalition that included the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, and other Muslim Brotherhood front groups condemned the attacks. On September 16, CARE took out a full page ad in the Washington Post denouncing the attacks. Within hours, CARE's Nihad Awad was prominently positioned next to President Bush. The face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. How did CARE get this close to power? Since its inception in 1994, CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, established more than 30 chapters across the country. And since 9-11, CARE has achieved nationwide acceptance from the inauguration of CARE Days in Houston and Tampa to the support of mayors, governors, congressmen, and senators. In 2007, PBS's Ray Suarez did an uncritical report that whitewashed CARE's ties to radical Islam. He stated that, quote, there have also been claims that some members of CARE have terrorist links, but there have been no charges linked to CARE itself, unquote. That statement omitted the fact that three CARE leaders had been convicted on terror-related crimes by that time. CARE also befriends and defends Muslim Brotherhood spiritual leader, Yusuf Karadawi. If you look at uh, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, one of the most famous uh, Muslim scholars at, in Cairo, Egypt, he has said unequivocally that people who commit suicide bombings um, and, and acts of terror are completely outside the bounds of Islam. In truth, for years, Karadawi has emphatically preached in support of suicide bombings. <laughs> In addition to enlisting the news media as defenders of CARE, CARE also shaped its message and image by intimidating America's entertainment ambassador, Hollywood. Hollywood has not been our ally. 
Hollywood has distorted the facts. Hollywood has shown freedom fighters as terrorists. Hollywood has done the work that Zionists could not done. Care claimed the films intending to depict Muslims as terrorists were racist. The group protested movies like True Lies, Executive Decision, and 1998's The Siege. This grievance of these groups were given extraordinary um, play by the media. And that surprised us a bit, because here we had all of this data talking about what had happened already in America, and what indeed might well someday happen. And yet the media felt obliged to, to give that kind of equal credence to the protest. Care was even more successful when pressuring filmmakers to change the villains from Islamic terrorists to neo-Nazis in 2002's Sum of All Fears. The producer of that film, Mace Neufeld, said, before we had typed a word on paper, I was getting complaints. The director, Phil Alden Robinson, wrote Care directly. I hope you will be reassured that I have no intention of promoting negative images of Muslims or Arabs, and I wish you the best in your continuing efforts to combat discrimination. After 9-11, CARE was also embraced by some within the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. Joint sessions with CARE were held routinely throughout the country. I also am on the mailing list for my Blackberry for CARE. Now, Mr. Hooper, I don't know what he does all day, but I know I get Blackberries. Must be 10 emails a day from CARE. And if I am not aware of what's going on in CARE, I will be at a loss. My record is clear. CARE is not a terrorist supporting organization. That is my experience. That is my interaction. And if you want to promote that, you're on your own. While ingratiating itself with law enforcement, CARE simultaneously discouraged other Muslims from cooperating with authorities. In late 2008, in the course of the largest terrorism financing trial in U.S. history, CARE was officially described as a front group for Hamas by an FBI agent on the witness stand. Prosecutors named CARE as an unindicted co-conspirator in the trial. With mounting scrutiny, the FBI officially cut its ties to CARE, explaining its decision in letters to inquiring congressmen. Until we can resolve whether there continues to be a connection between CARE or its executives and Hamas, the FBI does not view CARE as an appropriate liaison partner. CARE launched an all-out verbal assault on its former partner as a form of damage control, propagating incendiary conspiracy theories. But actually, the FBI, over the last eight years, have been engaging in actually paying informants as instigators. The FBI, by using informants as agent provocateurs, has recruited more so-called extremist Muslims than Al-Qaeda themselves. The deception continues. We need to establish this sort of everywhere. You don't give them rights because it's the American thing to do. You give them rights because it's the sort of thing that's going to be a weapon to use in the support of the Christ. Because of our tolerance of other faiths, we don't query Islamists. We don't probe into it as we do a political ideology. We give them the protection of religious freedom, when in fact it's a divisive, insurgent political ideology that threatens Western security, and yet we allow it to live under the bubble of protected religious speech and protected religious freedom. American culture is very tolerant, and it doesn't like to accuse people of things, you know. Uh, we like to give people a fair shake, and we're fair and honest people. And to that extent, uh, we don't like to believe bad things about people without hard proof. Without hard proof. And the things that these groups are involved in, uh, particularly Muslim Brotherhood, they're very difficult to prove. Many Americans want to be fair-minded. And if they're told by Muslim leaders, your suspicion means there's something wrong with you and you're probably a bigot, then 
all your defenses go down. The normal uh, suspicion you might have over, well, wait a minute, what do you really believe here? What are you really after here? You become afraid to say it because you don't want to get marked as a bigot. Increasingly, American institutions are engaged in self-censorship to stave off false charges of Islamophobia. In August 2008, publishing giant Random House scrapped plans to publish a romantic novel about Muhammad and his child bride Aisha after an academic advisor warned that the book might offend the Muslim community and incite violence. When Yale University Press published a book about controversial Danish cartoons that sparked deadly riots in 2006, it chose not to include the cartoons themselves for fear of inciting more violence. Comedy Central's animated series South Park drew death threats over its satiric depiction of Muhammad in 2010. This is a conscious strategy. It's to scream injustice, scream uh, particular things so that people will never dare to ever question certain things. Being a bully helps. No one wants to deal with the bullies, so everyone says, let's just give them what they want. Let's, in a way, appease them so that they're not going to, you know, keep banging, you know, and they're just, let's just, okay, let's just get them off our back. The Muslim Brotherhood-affiliated groups have been masterful in getting government officials to adopt their censorship campaign, such as refusing to even utter the term radical Islam. In the case of all three attempts in the last year, the terrorist attempts, one of which was successful, those individuals have had ties uh, to radical Islam. Uh, do you feel that uh, these individuals uh, might have been incited to take the actions that they did uh, because of radical Islam. Because of? Radical Islam. There are a variety of reasons why I think people um, have taken these actions. Um, it's hard, one, I think you have to look at each individual case. I mean, we're in the process now of talking to uh, Mr. Shahzad to try to understand what it is that drove him uh, to take the action. Okay. He but took. radical Islam could have been one of the reasons? There are a variety of reasons why but, people... But was radical Islam one of them? There are a variety of reasons why people do these things. Some of them are potentially religious okay, based. But all I'm asking Some, is if you think among those variety of reasons, radical Islam might have been one of the reasons uh, that the individuals took the steps that they did. We see, say, radical Islam. I mean, I think those people who it's, espouse a, a version of Islam that is not... Are you, are you uncomfortable attributing any of their actions to radical Islam? It sounds like... No, it. I don't want to say anything negative about a religion that is no, not... No, no, I'm not talking a, about a religion. I'm like talking Lachi. about radical Islam. I'm not talking about the general religion. Right, and I'm saying that a person like Anwar Alaki, for instance, who has a version of Islam that is not consistent with the teachings of it but, and who espouses a radical again, is, version. Could radical Islam have motivated these individuals to take the steps that they did? I certainly think that it's possible that people who espouse a radical version of Islam have had an ability to have an impact on people like Mr. Shahzad. Okay, and, and could it have been the case in one of these three instances? Could that have been the case? Uh, yeah, could, again, could one of these three individuals have been incited by radical Islam? Apparently, you feel that they could have been. Well, I think potentially incited by people who um, have a view of Islam that is inconsistent okay. with hard, the it's, Mr. AG, it's hard to uh, get an answer, yes or no, but let me go on to my next question. This has to do with... Islamic radicals deliberately but falsely portray the fight against radical Islam as a fight against all Muslims. This is not now a war on terrorism. We need to all be clear about this. This is a war against Muslims. It is a war against Muslims and Islam. Not only is it happening worldwide, but it's happening right here in America that is claiming to be fighting this war for the sake of freedom while it's infringing on the freedom of its own citizens just because they're Muslim, for no other reason. A 2006 Canadian intelligence report finds that the single most radicalizing factor in motivating Muslims to commit acts of violence is the false claim that there is a war on Islam. It started in Europe, but now in America too, saying, well, you can't both be Muslim and American. And uh, so your Muslim identity comes first. So the loyalty issue then becomes more with Muslims all over the world. Defending Muslim brothers and sisters was a crucial talking point for Anwar al-Awlaki, the bin Laden of the Internet. 
Prior to 9-11, the Muslim American Society, MAS, hired al Laki to be the imam at the Virginia-based Dar al-Hijra Mosque. Once he moved overseas, al Laki's language grew more violent towards Americans. al Laki's appeal was high among youth. Brotherhood-linked groups in the U.S., such as the Muslim Students Association, found on 400 campuses nationwide, are a gateway to that audience. I don't know this guy. I don't know what he did. I don't know what he said. I don't know what happened. But we defend Muslim brothers and we defend our Muslim sisters to the end. Is that clear? The important role that the Muslim Brotherhood plays is by educating young people and creating in their minds the, the worldview uh, that the West and, and Israel and so on are threats to Islam. And they have a very effective narrative for, uh, for socializing and indoctrinating new people. And once they're indoctrinated, it's only a short step from there to using violence to bring that about. Students are not the only ones vulnerable to this rhetoric. The case of Nidal Malik Hassan shows what happens when censorship and radicalization mix. In 2009, Hassan, an army psychiatrist, killed 13 people at Fort Hood in Texas. He had been corresponding with Anwar al -Aki. Only later on, after the shooting, did it come to light that Hassan's emails with al -Aki were considered relevant to his research on Islam and the military by the FBI's Washington field office. The ideas that inspired Nidal Hassan are seeded in Muslim Brotherhood ideology, which claims there's a war against Islam. This idea is then conveyed in America through Brotherhood front groups. The degree of sophistication that it takes to build a bomb or to pull a trigger is remote compared to the sophistication and the effort and the money and the energy that has to go into creating a civilization that would support it. We're not talking about a gun. We're talking about the man holding the gun. How do you build him? Stop calling them suicide bombers. Brotherhood legacy groups, such as the Muslim Students Association, host speakers who indoctrinate students on campuses around the country. Amir Abdel Malik Ali speaks in front of thousands of students every year. Here he weaves the Brotherhood motto into a Pledge of Allegiance at UCLA, with hundreds of students enthusiastically repeating the chant in response. We will end with the Pledge of Allegiance. And so you will repeat after me, inshallah, Allah is my Lord, Islam is my life, the Quran is my guide, the Sunnah is my practice, Jihad is my spirit, righteousness is my character, and paradise is my goal. For I enjoin what is right, I forbid what is wrong, I will fight against oppression, and I will die to establish Islam. Islam. testimony on the threat posed by homegrown terrorists to our nation's military communities. As a retired military officer, I quite frankly find it frustrating that we're playing politics on threat assessment. We should be able to identify the enemy, know who they are, and call them for what they are, and it's violent, radical, Islamic extremism, and be able to identify that. We owe that to our troops to identify the enemy and make sure that they are aware of it to protect them. Secretary Stockton, um, are we at war with violent Islamist extremism? No, sir. We are at war with Al-Qaeda. It's okay, affiliates I understand and that. Adherence. My question is, is violent Islamist extremism at war with us? No, sir. We are being attacked by Al-Qaeda, 
and its allies. Is Al-Qaeda, can it be described as being an exponent of violent Islamist extremism? Al-Qaeda are murderers with no, ideological I, agenda. Question. That wasn't my question. My question was, is Al-Qaeda acting out violent Islamist extremism? Al-Qaeda is a violent organization dedicated to overthrowing the values that we intend so to is advance. It yes or no? Can I hear the question again? I'll make it as clear as I can. We are not at war with Islam. I didn't ask and that. It is I not did not ask that, sir. I asked whether we're at war with violent Islamist extremism. That's my question. No, we're at war with Al-Qaeda and its so Al Qaeda. How does Al-Qaeda de define itself? Are they dedicated to violent uh, Islamist extremism? Al-Qaeda would love to convince Muslims around the world that the United States is at war with Islam. I didn't That's a say prime that. propaganda Sir. tool, and I'm not going to aid in a bet that no, effort no. My, my to question is, advance their propaganda goals. Is there goals. a difference between Islam and violent Islamist extremism? Sir, with great respect, I don't believe it's helpful to frame our adversary as Islamic with any set of qualifiers that we might add because we are not at war with Islam. I understand that. I never said we were at war with Islam. One of the questions we're trying to deal with is the radicalization of Islam, is the radicalization of Islamic youth. And if we can't distinguish between violent Islamist extremism and Islam, then um, all this stuff about behavioral uh, indicators doesn't mean anything well let me let me ask you this question is it a behavioral indicator to put on your card that you're a soldier of Allah a behavioral indicator that you have uh, a, a copy of inspire magazine that's on not your my desk question. that's not my question my question is is it a behavioral indicator to put on your card that you are a soldier of Allah as major Hassan did we have behavioral indicators now that enable our personnel, our supervisors, to focus on detecting indicators of violent extremism that reflect uh, the lessons learned from Fort Hood. Okay, is that a lesson learned? That uh, if you put uh, Soldier of Allah on your card, that uh, you ought to follow up and investigate that? We are training our supervisors to follow up on appropriate indicators and exercise the leadership they need in order to provide for effective reporting and inference. Do you agree with the statement to someone representing the Department of Defense uh, on the weekend after uh, the shooting that it would be a greater tragedy to lose our program of diversity than what had occurred? Well, uh, let me go back to something Secretary, uh, our Chairman King said. I was trained up by Senator Moynihan. There was nobody less politically correct than Senator Moynihan. I follow the truth wherever it takes me, and I strongly support the programs of the Department of Defense that I, focus on Al-Qaeda and behavioral I indicators. I this is not about political correctness. This is about well, defeating well, our sir, adversaries. Sir, I would disagree with you that it may not be about political correctness. We are here talking about the fact that we now have to have behavioral indicators. I agree with that. But my question is, if someone gives inflammatory, inflammatory remarks, as did Major Hassan, in an open setting, if he has on his card that he was a soldier of Allah, um, it seems to me to uh, be beyond common sense to think those are not behavioral indicators. So my question is, if I'm a member of the military today, and I see those two events or those two circumstances, would it be appropriate for me to report those as behavioral indicators? Now, that's not a question of whether or not you're being political correct, sir. I'm asking to answer that specific question. If I'm a soldier and ask you that question, what do you tell me? Inflammatory rhetoric of the sort associated with Major Hassan that needs to be reported, and our officers are trained up now to report on that behavior. I thank you, and I appreciate that. Hey, the gentleman's time has expired.